also we want to we want to uh, provide and explain our case for why we believe that the specific statements in Chapter 9 of the UMAX FSAR, specifically Section 9.5, regarding uh, the risk of scratches uh, during canister loading, why that information is not safety significant and it does not affect the functional performance of the UMAX system under the COC that's been granted by the NRC. So moving to slide four, just briefly talk first about the origin and, and prevalence of scratches. Uh, scratches on plates and shells, uh, specifically the MPC shell, are, are not unusual. In fact, they are a, a common occurrence, uh, especially when you consider the manufacturing aspects of the MPC, the handling of the, of the raw material and the plates, the various uh, manufacturing activities that uh, the plates are uh, subjected to, bending, forming, shearing, etc. It, it is fairly common and, and even expected that there will be surface scratches on these plates and shells uh, throughout that process. And, and, and similarly, it, it wouldn't be uncommon even in the field during handling that there may be some uh, incidental surface scratches on the NPC as well. Uh, as a manufacturer, we have procedures in place so that we can limit the admissible depth and population or density of the scratches. And, and we control that or we, we, uh, we screen that using our manufacturing procedure, HSP320, which places specific limits in the manufacturing space on, on the depth and uh, size and, and density of the scratches. Moving to slide number five. So what are the, what are the mechanisms by which these scratches occur? There's two basic, when we talk about the MPC and the MPC shell, there's two basic mechanisms that we've observed and we've noted that uh, are the physical mechanisms for uh, causing these scratches. The first is simple abrasive wear when you have two materials that are rubbing against each other. Uh, usually if there, there may be a harder material involved that impinges or rubs against the other material, in this case the MPC shell, under some contact load. That is one form of, of wear and, and one cause of the surface scratches. The other effect or phenomenon that, that is in play here is adhesive wear. Uh, and this can occur when the materials are compatible or have sim similar metallurgy, such as austenitic stainless steel, uh, where you have uh, a bonding of the material and a transference of the material across the two interfacing surfaces. So it can deposit material on one surface and, uh, and remove material from the other surface. So there's a combination of effects here, both abrasive wear and adhesive wear that we observe uh, uh, both in the manufacturing space and, and, and in the field as well. Uh, what, we, what we do know and we can say in general is that the depth and width of these scratch marks are uh, proportional or related to the contact force. And they are also dependent on as we say on the slide, the state of armor on the stainless steel. What I mean by that, the state of armor, is that differing plates may have differing uh, chromium oxide layers that, that act as a barrier, and uh, the, in, the indentation hardness or the Brunel hardness, uh, which is a, a common measure, that may vary from, from one plate to the other. So that can also influence the depth uh, and width of the scratches. But, but most certainly, the, the magnitude of the contact force is a key driver that, that determines the, the scratch depth and, and its size. In, in terms of prediction, uh, with, when you take into consideration the differing effects, as I mentioned, both abrasive wear and adhesive wear, it, is, it becomes a difficult process or a difficult exercise to predict the scratches numerically um, using uh, you know, analytical tools to determine uh, a scratch depth. Uh, it's, it, it, it's, there, there are tech, 
techniques for uh, estimating the abrasive wear, the effects of adhesive wear become even more difficult when you when they are uh, you attempt to predict them by numerical techniques. I'll move to slide six now. So, you know, we, we want in general to try and minimize the extent of scratching, uh, but we we don't minimize scratching at the extent at the expense of all other uh, design and performance considerations. Uh, there are other factors that we have to take in consideration in conjunction with the scratches as we uh, develop the design. And, and what I mean by other considerations are things such as radiation dose, um, seismic design, seismic resistance. And when we talk about the UMAX storage system, uh, two specific examples of that are the UMAX uh, module has a shield ring near the top of the cavity. And the shield ring it has a specific purpose to limit the radiation dose to the crew during uh, field operations and the MPC download event. So for that shield ring to be, to be most effective, the clearance gap between the canister OD and the shield ring is, is kept to a, a minimum to the extent practical. And, and in this case, the, the diametral clearance is approximately a half inch between the ID of the shield ring and the OD of the canister. And that enables us to uh, effectively reduce the dose in the field during download operations. Likewise, when the MPC is seated inside the UMAX, there are seismic restraints that brace the canister inside the, the, uh, the module and uh, mitigate the loads on the canister during a, a postulated earthquake scenario. So that also calls for fairly close uh, clearance gaps between the seismic restraints and the canister. So the end result based on those design decisions uh, is that we have a, a UMAX system that has a, a, a very high seismic tolerance capability and we've also um, limited the dose to the crew during those field operations. So as, as designers, we've made a risk-based a risk, uh, a risk -based decision. We, we weigh the risks of surface scratches against other performance objectives and performance needs. And, and in this case, uh, our, our our conclusion is that uh, the scratches that we're speaking of are, are mainly cosmetic in nature or of, of uh, insignificant consequence. And there's, they're tolerated uh, in the interest of the other uh, performance benefits that I just mentioned, namely reduced uh, dose rates and uh, increased seismic capability. Moving to slide seven. So as we as we begin to consider the surface scratches on the MPC from an ASME code standpoint, it's fairly clear cut when you when you look at the code definitions that that these surface scratches are examples of local structural discontinuity. So I want to take a moment here to, to explain what I mean by local structural discontinuities and give some examples. Um, a local structural discontinuity by code definition is, it, 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 it is a, a stress concentration that affects the stress and strain distribution through a fractional part of the wall thickness. Uh, and, and it also does not affect shell type deformation. Uh, it, it, it typically doesn't cause any uh, visible distortion of the shell. Uh, examples of a local structural discontinuity may be a small radius, a uh, small fillet radius, um, a small penetration or opening, and in the, in the, in the slide seven, we show a couple other examples that are specific to the MPC itself. Um, 
one example would be the small lifting holes that are in the the lid, the MPC lid, which are used to to uh, handle the lid as well as the MPC. And even if you think about the lid to shell weld, uh, which is uh, part of the containment boundary, uh, that closure weld, even if the surface of that weld, which hopefully you can see in the uh, the close-up photo there, it's it's quite uneven, and there's numerous ridges and undulations in that surface. So even even those irregularities in the weld would be the examples of local structural discontinuities, as well as any surface scratches on the MPC. So the point that, that we want to make here is that local structural discontinuities are uh, quite prevalent on the MPC canister in, in many different forms. And, and scratches on the surface is just one uh, obvious example of a local structural discontinuity. Uh, and, and the slide also points out an example of a gross structural discontinuity, which is at the bottom of the MPC. This is sort of the classic example where you have the shell to base plate uh, joint, where you have a 90 degree corner. And what differentiates a gross structural discontinuity from a local structural discontinuity is that gross structural discontinuities affect the stress through the thickness. And it, it, uh, they're typically throughout or uniform throughout the, the shell diameter. Uh, so that's why uh, something like the shell to base plate joint uh, is a classic example of a gross structural discontinuity. And it's important that we point that out here because in ASME code space, dependent on whether a feature is a local structural discontinuity or a gross structural discontinuity, it, it affects or influences the stress category and how those stresses are evaluated or categorized and subsequently evaluated within the ASME code. So again, just to conclude on this slide, uh, MPC or surface scratches on the MPC shell would be clear examples of local structural discontinuities within the context of ASME code section three. Moving to slide eight, I'd like to take a moment here to just talk about the, uh, the UMAX system, and, and which is a vertical canister system, with, which uh, by design helps to minimize or mitigate the, the scratches that, that may occur in the field during handling and loading operations. The one you know, valuable benefit of the vertical canister system is that the, the contact loads that uh, develop during downloading and field operations are significantly reduced as compared to uh, a horizontal canister system because since the canister is hanging vertical, the, the lateral contact forces, uh, by virtue of the, the confined space and the limited uh, freedom of movement of the canister, those local uh, lateral contact forces are limited to a very small percentage of the total canister weight. When you look at the UMAX system and you consider the, the inside diameter of the high track as well as the, the UMAX storage module, the maximum feasible rotation of the MPC is, is very small, uh, on the order of one degree. So with such small rotation angles, it it's really becomes physically impossible to to have a very large lateral contact force between the MPC and the internal features of the UMAX system. And that's why we, we, we conclude on the slide that the maximum contact force, even under the worst hypothetical configuration of the MPC, is, is still only on the order of about 2.5% of the canister weight, whereas in a horizontal system, that lateral contact load on the shell could be uh, much more significant, uh, as much as the full full weight of the of the canister system. So this 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 
limits the uh, the potential size and depth of the scratches and and our our own investigation both numerical and and through tests show that those scratches are 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 shallow with respect to the thickness of the shell and in fact the our our estimates of the abrasive wear uh, specific to the the MPC inside the UMAX, uh, by our calculations, the, the depth of the scratch due to abrasive wear is, is on the order of 1.2 mils, or 0 0.0012 inches per thousand pounds of force. So even <coughs> even if the maximum contact force is as much as 2,500 pounds, you multiply that by 2.5. We're still talking about uh, scratches due to abrasive wear that are on the order of, of two to three mils in depth. And the tests we've conducted some tests in our in our uh, manufacturing shop to simulate the contact behavior, and we've 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 found that the in terms of the abrasive wear. Um, which is more a measure of the, the average depth of the scratch over the, the, the width, is in line with the numerical estimates. But as I was mentioning earlier, we also see in the actual test results that there's evidence of an adhesive wear as well, where there's some surface galling, which can create peaks and valleys, even within a, a specific wear mark or scratch mark. So we do see when we look at the, the combination of abrasive and adhesive wear that the, the the depth, the maximum depth of those valleys, uh, considering both effects, can be larger than uh, than the two to three mils that I just stated due to abrasive wear. Slide number nine. Next. So, continuing what I was just saying a moment ago. Um, when we look at our uh, the shop test results as well as our numerical predictions and finite element analyses, we see consistency between them that the, the maximum average scratch depth, which is more of a measure of abrasive wear, is, is, is bounded by 2.4 mils, 0 0.0024 inches. And to put that into context, the minimum required wall thickness to meet the design internal pressure for our canister, which is 100 PSIG, the minimum required thickness to, to resist just that internal pressure load is 0.216 inches. Now that number uh, takes into consideration the minimum material, the minimum strength properties of the material, as well as the applicable metal temperature. But for a canister of our size and dimension with 100 PSIG internal pressure. The minimum required thickness to meet NB3324 is 0.216 inches. Uh, keep in mind that the nominal wall thickness for our canisters is a minimum of a half inch, and there are, there is uh, an option as well that the, the thickness can be uh, uh, five eighths of an inch thick. So there is a, a substantial thickness reserve, more than a quarter inch, that's available for. Uh, imperfections such as scratches and, and, and uh, other, other considerations as well. When we look at some of the, the field test measure, the field measurements, uh, when we looked, when we've examined loaded canisters, we do see that uh, in general the, 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 the scratch marks are, um, are small in size to the eye. They're 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 not significant at all. Almost invisible in in, in some cases. The worst case scratch that was measured uh, in the loaded canisters had a a maximum depth of 26 mils at a specific a specific location where we observed a combination of abrasive and adhesive wear and some some presence of galling. But it still remains that even the, the 26 mil maximum depth is, is a 
small fraction of what is the minimum required wall thickness from a internal pressure standpoint. So we have a lot of uh, inherent margin in the design to uh, accommodate any uh, incidental surface uh, surface scratches. Slide number 10. So I want to come back now to the, the ASME code and the classification of, of uh, stresses as it relates to surface scratches. Um, to start with, we need to recognize that the MPCs are designed uh, to, the, to the highest uh, design standard in ASME code section 3. They are designed as uh, subsection NB class 1 vessels. So this is uh, the same code that would apply to reactor vessel and pressure, pressurizers and nuclear reactors. So it's, it's uh, the highest design standard um, and manufacturing standards for the, the, the NBC canister. And when we, when you uh, go further into subsection NB and and look at the stress requirements, there are there are three basic stress categories that have to be considered. The first being primary stress. I've cited the applicable code paragraph there. Primary stresses are the the most important and the the, constro the, the controlling stress type. For the vessel. Primary stresses are limited under all service load conditions, normal conditions, as well as accident conditions. Uh, and these, these, the primary stress is the basic stress component that satisfies basic force and moment equilibrium. The next tier of stress category is secondary stress. Uh, these are somewhat, I guess, less uh, significant, if you will, as compared to primary stresses. And these tend to be associated with gross structural discontinuities, uh, which I, I described or mentioned earlier. So these would be an example of secondary stresses would be the, the local stresses in the vicinity of the shell to base plate joint. Uh, that would, uh, that gross structural discontinuity would, would uh, produce secondary stresses in that area. The third stress category is peak stresses. And in terms of the MPC, in this application, peak stresses are, are not significant to the, the design or the performance of the MPC, and, I, and I'll explain that further. But, but it's also important to know that peak stresses are also attributed to local structural discontinuity. And we go to the next slide, slide 11. The reason that peak stresses are not of significance as it relates to the MPC is that um, by code definition, peak stresses are only objectionable from a standpoint of fatigue or brutal fracture. So in the context of the MPC, the MPC is a passive system. There's no moving parts. There's no active cooling system. Uh, when, when the MPC is in long-term storage, it, it's in a static resting state. There are very, very minimal pressure and temperature fluctuations. So there's no Credible risk of fatigue for the MPC canister, and in fact, we 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 make that conclusion uh, in in the UMAX FSR. I pointed out Table three one ten, um, the last sentence in that paragraph I excerpted. It says because fatigue is not a credible source of failure in a passive system. With gradual temperature changes, the cumulative damage factor from fatigue is not computed for the UMAX components. So fatigue is, is a non-credible failure mechanism for the MPC canister. So fatigue is not a concern um, when we think of or consider peak stresses for the canister. 
I also mentioned brutal fracture. That also is, is ruled out because the MPC in our case is manufactured from austenitic stainless steel, which is a ductile material, and, and therefore it is immune to brutal fracture uh, failure, which is also uh, stated in, a, in the UMAX FSR with respect to the MPC. So having ruled out fatigue and brutal fracture, peak stresses are no longer of any any concern with respect to the MPC and its structural design. That's why we stay, stay here on the, on the slide. In conclusion, local discontinuities produce peak stress, which is immaterial to the safety margin in an MPC. And, and that's, that's an important technical point, which will then, um, as we go forward, um, uh, influence of the licensing aspects, but again, I guess just to summarize that technical point, the, the surface scratches on the MPC are by code definition example of local structural discontinuities, which means that they are local stress concentrations which are only capable of producing peak stresses, and peak stresses are only a concern from an ASME co-design standpoint from a fatigue and brittle fracture. And, and neither of those failure mechanisms are, uh, are credible with respect to the, the MPC canister and its design. I'll move to slide 12. And, and this just reiterates what I was just saying, that, that the local discontinuities are associated with peak stresses, and although peak stresses are are common and, and present in the MPC, there, there's no risk. They pose no risk to the, the safety or structural design of the MPC for the reasons I just mentioned. And, and that is why, of course, in Chapter 2 of our FSR, under principal design criteria, we do not place any limit on peak stresses with respect to the MPC canister. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier in Table 3.110 of the FSR, uh, the fatigue is, is ruled out as a credible failure mechanism, uh, as is brittle fracture. So there's no need to place any, any limit um, on, on peak stresses with respect to the MPC. And furthermore, if you look at the safety evaluation report for the UMAX system. Uh, for those, for those uh, same reasons, there's no mention of peak stresses in the safety evaluation report because they're not, uh, they don't pose any risk to, the, to the, the MPC and therefore they don't have any bearing on the safety determination with respect to uh, the structural design of the MPC. And likewise, the COC for the UMAX system does not uh, make any specific mention of, of uh, scratches or local discontinuities uh, or peak stresses present in the MPC. So we think that's important because it doesn't, if, it, if, if, if those aspects aren't discussed in the FCR or the COC, uh, it, it implies that, uh, that there's, they are not uh, not important to the safety determination of the MPC. I'll move next to slide 13. And so now I'll, I'll get into uh, the licensing aspects uh, a little bit more, moving away from the technical and more into the FSR and the licensing aspects. And so first I, I, I want to kind of classify the contents of an FSR and, and we'd like we think of it as in, in three different categories. The first being safety critical information. And this is material as you'd expect that that's in the COC and therefore it is it is locked in place. Uh, you cannot change safety critical information in the COC without a license amendment. The next tier would be safety significant information. 
And this would be information that's not explicitly in the COC, but it, it has a, a safety significance, and therefore it is subject to the 7248 process. And depending on the outcome of that process, um, it may be, uh, it, you may be able to implement a change via that process, or under, under certain circumstances it may uh, force you into amendment space. The third category would be non-safety significant information. We define this as supplemental information that is not relied on to fill a safety function and is not included in the NRC SCR. Um, so that's, we, we wanted to make that distinction um, to, to then discuss the considerations of the aspects of the NPC scratches. So moving next to slide 14, regulatory perspective on scratches on the canisters. So the first, the first point that we'd like to make is that the scratches are not mentioned or relied on in the NRC's SCR for UMAX, as I said a moment ago. And in fact, as we did our own investigation, we found that there was no mention of scratches in, in any of the previous SERs for any of the whole tech storage systems, which, which is not surprising to us for, for the reasons that I, I stated earlier. The scratches um, are associated with peak stresses, and because we're not concerned here with fatigue or brittle fracture, uh, those surface scratches and, and the associated peak stresses are not safety significant, or they don't, they don't have any bearing on the, the safety uh, determination of the NPC. And, and, and even when we look beyond our own storage systems and the, the SERs associated with them, we were not able to find any, any evidence where the scratches, uh, surface scratches on the canisters were treated any differently uh, going back several decades. Moving to slide 15. So what we conclude from both from a technical and licensing aspect is that the presence of surface scratches on the MPC are not relevant to the safety determination. And any discussion of the scratches in the FSR represents what we would consider non-safety significant information, along with you know, other examples of non-safety items in the MPC. And then, as a result, once we come to the conclusion that surface scratches are non-safety significant, Then, then, it, then it means that any any clarifying of the FSR discussion cannot apply a change of any safety consequence. And the statement in the FSR regarding no risk of scratching during insertion can be, can, in, in our judgment, can can be deleted or amendment amended without affecting the safety analyses and conclusions in the FSR. Maybe maybe I'll probably take it short then further here because now it gets more and more into into like six phase here. So, uh, <coughs> so this is Stefan um, Stefan and John. Um, so that probably brings us to the point. Why are we discussing all this, all of these things? Of course, we have the technical issue of the strategy, but the other issue is that we that we uh, had in our apps a a, a statement uh, that said in, in in some context that there is no risk of, of scratching. And uh, uh, of course, that uh, uh, people's attention, and they they uh, they said, well, uh, how does that how does that uh, uh, fit in fit in everything? So um, we we looked at this. We, we we definitely determined that the the intent was not to actually include a, a, every uh, any type of scratches, as we just uh, Chuck just explained. Uh, they are kind of a. a, a uh, part of life if you work with, with materials and, and also
So uh, we we have we are concluding. So our investigation is going through the Eric report that they don't have any safety significance. Uh, nevertheless, we have a statement in the EFSA that we need to need to deal with that because it is at a minimum it's confusing and we need to uh, uh, we need to do something about it. Of course, if they, if we ever find that something is not not correct or not appropriate in the in the FSAR, there's a process to change that. Uh, we have our change process ourselves, and any changes that we want to make, in this case, we decided to make a clarification to it, uh, it has to go through this process, and that's the 7248 process. Um, we have done that. We, uh, we have put the, the wording is, is in here. The old wording talks about no risk of scratching, and uh, uh, we, we've been changing that uh, uh, recently, not too long ago, to basically give some clarification on that and explain that there is a that there can be incidental scratches, but that they have no no uh, no safety significance. And I think uh, Chuck's uh, uh, full discussion uh, uh, backs the uh, uh, the technical part of this. Uh, of course, we've also gone through the uh, all the requirements of 7248. There are a total, I think, there are eight eight requirements. There are eight questions that you need to answer and. Uh, uh, to go through this to determine that you are actually able to make this change without having to request a license amendment. And so we went through this, and our conclusion was that uh, that we uh, uh, that this uh, is, is possible without any problems. And so we, we made that uh, change in, in our EFSA. Um, and uh, as as always, of course, this will be available, or that is available for inspection. Uh,
impression uh, that there is a link between this uh, uh, the section 9.4, the statement about the no scratches, and the and the COC. And uh, uh, I wanted to comment a little bit on a little bit on this. Apparently, uh, there is a uh, uh, there has a link has been has been seen between the table in the in the certificate in the tax specs uh, then some section of chapter two uh, and that then in the end uh, uh, points to chapter nine and uh, uh, the concern was was, uh, was presented to us that uh, this would mean that really the statement about no scratches has essentially become a part of the uh, of the COC uh, this is something rather odd and, and confusing from our perspective and I just wanted to comment on this uh, um, we are very well aware that there are sometimes sections in the EFSA that are included by reference into the into the certificate. We have these examples in some of our EFSAs uh, uh, for previously, and because for one reason or the other, you have a large section of the EFSA that is considered so important that it cannot be changed, and there is a they, and they rather than including pages and pages of the of the EFSA into the certificate, there is basically a is included by reference. In that case, in the EFSA, there will be a clear indication of this. There will be uh, given some examples here. Everything is put there in bold text. Uh, uh, there is an there is an introduction saying the next couple of pages cannot be changed uh, uh, in any way, shape, or form other than through a license. Uh, I've put a couple of examples in here where we see that. Um, the, uh, 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 we, 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 we see those such things here, and this is a kind of a regulatory uh, precedent. We've seen that uh, in the past, and I think that's always been followed. Uh, the idea that something that is not identified in the EFSA could be implicitly uh, included in the, uh, in the certificate, and therefore, that any change to that is prevented uh, under 7240 years seems rather odd. I think that would be, from my perspective, almost a change in, uh, in, in, in a regulatory practice, and I would be rather confusing. Uh, now, I'm not saying that this is considered. I'm only saying this was brought to our attention, and, and therefore I wanted to I wanted to comment on that. That uh, that I would I would think that is a a, a strange connection that is. That is, uh, if that was made there, uh, uh, because just I want to basically make the, the distinction between something explicitly included by reference and something just simply reference. I mean, the, the certificate, of course, references the EFSA in a, in a few places, but uh, uh, that does not mean that these places are uh, cannot be changed anymore. It's just uh, just that that uh, uh, that is what is important enough to. To mention that they are, that they are there in the uh, uh, in the uh, in the EFSA and, uh, and, and present some important part of it. So I just wanted to make that statement. Maybe it's not necessary because it's not really a concern. But if it's a concern, I would hope that this uh, that this may be taken into, into consideration uh, in that respect. And uh, that brings us essentially to our to the end of the. Uh, of the of our presentation, we just have a summary. Chuck, maybe I don't know whether you cover them. Sure, yeah, I can. I can. I can cover the closing remarks. So, I think this slide kind of just does a good job of summarizing what we what we've said throughout the presentation, and there's a certain logic to uh, to the bullets in terms of their sequence or order here. Um, the first thing that we've we presented today is that you know, localized scratches are an inevitable factor in, in regards to the NPC, whether it's a result of manufacturing, uh, operations, or, or even transport at some point in time. From the, from the HITSUME code standpoint, the localized scratches uh, are not of any concern from a stress compliance standpoint under the, the uh, rules and definitions of ASME Section 3. And therefore, we don't violate the scratches, don't, don't uh, amount to a violation.
violation of any design or licensing requirement in the FSR. And so that leads us to conclude that the localized scratches are not a safety concern, nor, they do, nor do they affect the NPC's functionality. And then from there, once we reach that conclusion, we can then make the determination that the statement in FSR Section 9.5 represents non-safety significant information, because it cannot affect the safety margin or safety uh, determination of the NPC. And because we're dealing with non-safety significant information in Section 9.5, it then enables us to use the 10 CFR 7248 process to clarify the language uh, with regard to wear and scratch marks on the external surface of the NPC. And as Stefan said, we've, we've, by this point in time, have gone through that 7248 process and made uh, specific changes to the wording in Section 925. So that, that concludes the presentation, and, and, and really, you know, we wanted to explain to you uh, our, our reasoning and, and the thought process that, that brought us to that point, so that we could consider it further. Okay, thank you, Chuck. Yes, Devin? Yes. Um, this is Mike Layton. I do appreciate you taking the time and coming in and walking us through both the technical aspects of what uh, one of us to understand, and also some of the uh, regulatory thoughts as you went forward with. 7248. And I'll, I'll simply make a comment that, and this is more for folks who don't know the Part 72 regulations, like the back of the hand. The 7248 process that uh, Stefan talked about is a part of the regulation that allows licensees to make changes and tests um, in accordance with uh, some very specific criteria on screening that are laid out. And if all of those um, criteria are passed, then the choice is up to um, the design authority, which is Holtec, to potentially make a change to certain documents uh, on their own without having to come in with a, a license amendment. So this is the first time that we've heard that you've already gone through the 7248 process for this issue. Like you mentioned, Stefan, uh, there is no requirement for you to submit that for NRC approval. It is an item that is open for inspection. So at, at some point, as we go through our routine uh, announced inspections, that will be something that we will likely look at or evaluate as, as we that 7248 evaluation in addition to others that you've done in the past period uh, since the last uh, inspection that you've done. So with that, 